Good evening and welcome to Rock Center. The impact of Apple on life in America is well established by any standard. They have changed our electronics and our culture. And whether you're the owner of Apple products or not, you've got to admit that much. As much as any company can be about one guy, Apple was Steve Jobs. And now that Steve Jobs is gone, Apple is run by Tim Cook. He hasn't talked a whole lot about his life or his business. He certainly hasn't done so on television until now. Apple is famously secretive, and so it, while it took months of meetings and negotiations, Tim Cook agreed to be interviewed, and we met up at one of the places Apple has transformed. Nobody remembers the guy who came after Thomas Edison. And nobody seems to recognize Tim Cook as we walk together across the teeming floor of Grand Central Station. I'm a private person yep. and, you know, I like my being anonymous. As we walk, we're surrounded by examples of what Apple has done to our society, both good and bad. People now live their lives while listening to the soundtrack of their lives, communicating with members of their own community while ignoring the actual community around them. And in this marble monument to another time where trains lumber to a halt two stories beneath our feet, we go up the stairs into what we were told the future would look like. The red shirts greet us, and Tim Cook is home now in the Apple store, where the successor to Jobs is suddenly treated more like Jagger. Hey, good to see you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. I've you for a long time. Thank you. Sign for me, please. I'm a big fan. I have been a big fan for for four years. There you go. It's pretty spectacular. Who else would have put a store like this in Grand Central? And who else would have us believe they intend to be the one company that reverses hundreds of years of business history by becoming the one company that never fades away into irrelevance? <laughs> you realize if you're a company that can keep amazing us, consumers, if you're a company that can stay fresh without an expiration date, you'll be the first company ever to do that. There is a cycle, that circle of life, uh, a life and death, and you're trying to buck that trend. Don't bet against us, Brian. Don't bet against us. We started our day with Tim Cook in lower Manhattan at another of his 250 austere Apple stores, where we began the questioning with what's different about him. How are you not Steve Jobs? In many ways, one of the things he did for me uh, that removed a gigantic burden that would have normally existed is he told me on a couple of occasions uh, before he passed away to never question what he would have done. Never ask the question what Steve would have do to just do what's right. Doing right has done well for Tim Cook so far. He's had a good first year on the job. The company's stock is up about 45% during his tenure. And think about this. He's already presided over the rollout of three iPads, two iPhones, and three Macs. It is beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. Every detail has been focused on. So you've got guys whose job it is to get this mesh right, to get this this curve it, right to get it precisely right in but fairness however this past year they haven't gotten everything precisely right weather nice weather starting with siri the small woman who lives in your iphone the service amazed all of us at first but then came under criticism for not being perfect or as consistently amazing as steve jobs wanted it to be then there are the maps. iPhones used to come with Google Maps until they set out on their own. But Apple's version wasn't quite ready for launch. It lacked some critical street smarts. And in those early days, God help you if you went anywhere near the Brooklyn Bridge or the Hoover Dam. It was a rare and public embarrassment, and Cook fired two top executives in charge. And how big of a setback was Maps? It didn't meet our customers' expectations, and our expectations of ourselves are even higher than our customers. Uh, however, I can tell you, it, so we screwed up. And you said goodbye to some executives. Well, we screwed up, and we are putting the weight of the company behind correcting it. As for the iPhone 5 itself, they have flown off those perfect Apple Store shelves. All right, there you go. 
Apple sold 5 million of them in the first weekend alone, breaking all previous sales records. But buyers of the iPhone 5 soon discovered they had to buy something else. None of the old power cords work on the new equipment. Why did we have to buy new cords for this? As it turns out, we had a connector, 30-pin connector, yeah. that we used for a decade or I've more. Got 500 of them. You at have home a few of those any, yeah. on on an iPod. But Brian, it was one of those things where we couldn't make this product with that connector. But let me tell you, the product is so worth it. And that's the thing about Apple. Sleek isn't cheap. Those white earbuds announce to the world you've got a couple of hundred dollars to spend. Your investment will buy you a staggeringly beautiful product that works unlike any other. And in a lot of workplaces, including our own, the Apple products you'll see are the ones people bring in from home. They're usually right there on the desk next to the computers we have to use for work. Apple prides itself on being equal parts computer company and religion. Apple fans get whipped up into a stampeding froth with every new product release. Customers famously camp outdoors and then emerge triumphant, emotionally spent. Journalists flock to those dramatic product rollouts as if the CEO is going to reveal stone tablets instead of the kind with scratch-proof glass. And the legendary Apple culture of secrecy is designed to keep it that way. Why are you institutionally so secretive? Why, how is it that you know how many times I've listened to a Bob Dylan song or a Kendrick Lamar song or Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, and yet we never get to know anything about you guys? We think that holding our product plans secret is very important because people love surprises. This was one surprise Apple could not have loved, the new Samsung ad campaign. It's blistering, bold, damaging. It portrays Apple products and people who love them as somehow passe and uncool, even desperate. It's a blunt instrument disguised as satire, and it's a frontal attack on a giant that would have been unthinkable not too long ago. Hey, what'd you just do? Oh, I just sent him a playlist. By touching phones? Yeah. Simple as that. It's the Galaxy S3. I'll see you at the studio later. Later. When do you think we're going to be able to do that thing? Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey, Mom, Dad. Oh, thanks for holding our spot. You guys have fun. Oh, my midnight, you too. <laughs> the next big thing is already here. The Samsung Galaxy S3. But, honey, this is the line for apps. The unmistakable message right there? Apple products are for your parents. Samsung makes the really cool stuff, and they're much more casual about it. They came along and tried to paint those with white earbuds, Apple users, as losers. They're trying to paint their product as cool and yours as not cool. Is this thermonuclear war? Well, we love our customers, and uh, we're, we'll fight to defend them with anyone. Uh, is it thermonuclear war? Um, the, the, the reality is, is that we love competition at Apple. We think it makes us all better. But we want people to invent their own stuff. He's talking about the legal fight between Apple and Samsung. They've sued each other in courts around the world over patent infringements. Apple won the last round in the U.S. when a jury ruled Samsung owed them a billion dollars for stealing ideas. Samsung was back in court just today appealing the judgment. Sometimes the business of making pretty things is ugly. How tough is your business? How surprised would we civilians be? at how rough it gets, spying, skullduggery. It's tough. It's very tough. Uh, you have people trying to hack into systems on a constant basis. Uh, you have people trying to elicit confidential information uh, about future product plans. All of these things are things that we constantly fight. And then there's Tim Cook's larger challenge, the man who rhapsodizes about the perfectly rounded edges of his products, vows to always keep Apple cutting edge. It sounded to me like you and I grew up the same American life, kind of a grindingly simple and normal American middle class household. When you and I as kids would go to a neighbor's house and see under their new TV, Sony Trinitron, 
that would tell us something instantly, and you're smiling. And that brand lasted up until um, uh, Walkman, Discman. But then, fast forward to today, it's less meaningful. How do you not become Sony, with all apologies to Sony? We're very simple people at Apple. We focus on making the world's best product and enriching people's lives. I think some companies, uh, maybe even the one that you mentioned, maybe they decided that they could do everything. We have to make sure at Apple that we stay true to focus, laser focus. We can only do great things a few times, only on a few products. But will the next great thing be Apple's long-rumored move into the television business? It's a market that we have intense interest in, and it's a market that we see that has been left behind. What does he mean by that? Tim Cook goes on to talk about that. We'll show you as much as he's willing to say about what might be the next big thing when we come back with part two of our interview right after this break. This is the first time Apple's Tim Cook has done this, a full-on television interview. It's also the first time he's spoken in any detail about the death of the legendary co-founder Steve Jobs. And here now, part two of our conversation. In August 2011, Tim Cook was made CEO of Apple. Steve Jobs reduced his own role to chairman of the board. Then, less than two months later, he was gone after a long fight with pancreatic cancer. It's so great to see so many of you here today. It was Tim Cook who was chosen to preside over the private memorial service for Apple employees. Thousands of people gathered as the face of the founder gazed down upon them from the side of the building. It was, um, it was the saddest time of my life. Did you know how sick he was? I always thought that he would bounce back because he always did. And it wasn't until extremely close to the end that I reached a, sort of an intellectual point that that he couldn't bounce this time. Uh, big boss coming through. Big boss people look alive. Wonderful to meet you. Good to you doing. It's his company to run to now, and after the peaceful transition of power, he was quickly forced into crisis footing because of the situation in China, where so many Apple products are assembled by skilled workers. There's been trouble, and Cook traveled there after harsh criticism of poor working conditions and low wages. The situation was later parodied on SNL by cast members who actually make up the heart of Apple's demographic. Oh no, talk about Apple map. It no work, right? It took you to wrong place. You want Starbucks to take you to Dunkin' Donut? That must be so hard for you. China remains a major issue for Apple, and Tim Cook seems to have a ready answer for it. Why can't you be a made in America company? You know, this, uh, this iPhone, as a matter of fact, the engine in here is made in America. And not only are the engines in here made in America, but engines are made in America and are exported. The glass on this phone is made in Kentucky. And so we've been working for years on doing more and more in the United States. Next year, we will do one of our existing Mac lines in the United States. Let's say our Constitution was a little different and Barack Obama called you in tomorrow and said... Um get everybody out of China and do whatever you have to do, make these, make everything you make in the United States, what would that do to the price of this device? I, honestly, it's not so much about price, it's about the skills, etc. Over time, um, there are skills that are associated with manufacturing that have left the U.S. Not, not necessarily people, but the education system stopped producing them. Cook says Apple has already created more than 600,000 jobs here in the U.S. That includes everything from research and development to retail to a solar power farm. He also points to the app industry, another one of those that didn't exist before Apple came along. All those icons and all those downloads employ a lot of people. All this side is iPods here. It was such a different world just six years ago when we sat down with Steve Jobs for one of his last television interviews. 
He showed us around Apple's flagship store on Fifth Avenue in New York, which six years later is still the big glass granddaddy of them all. Back then, Steve Jobs was, as usual, all about the future. We've got some really great ideas of the products we're going to build next year and the year after that we're working real hard on. So I, I think our focal length is, you know, is always forward. He was all black turtleneck and the glass frames and mystical and mysterious. And, you know, forgive me, you and I could work at a Best Buy. We're, you know, plain-looking people. You're a much more conventional-seeming guy. But there's obviously brain power he saw in you that you brought to bear on this job. I'm not sure a conventional person would have come to Apple at that point in time. Almost everyone I know thought I was crazy. That's because Apple was on the ropes back in 1998. Steve Jobs had just come back and was trying to steal Cook away from Compact Computer, a now faded name that was actually vibrant back then. I just got to Compaq. I just got into Houston. I agreed to come out and talk. Five minutes into the conversation with him, I'm wanting to throw caution to the wind and come to Apple. And... You know, the rest is history. <laughs> Tim Cook's personal history starts in Robertsdale, Alabama, the son of a Gulf Coast shipyard worker and a mom who stayed at home. After working in an aluminum factory as a teenager, he went off to Auburn and then to Duke for an MBA. Among what little else we know about him, he's got a lot of Bob Dylan on his iPod, and Bobby Kennedy was his hero. He still has his accent from the South. These days he finds solitude in the West. For all the folks trying to get to know you and figure you out, where do you go when you need to go someplace? I work out to keep stress away. I'm in the gym by 5 a.m. every morning. If I have some free time, I go to a national park. I love getting in nature. And so this, these are the things that calm my mind and allow me to think clearly. And, and so that's what I do. This is kind of your television coming out, and I'm, I'm glad you did this. Does this mean you have reached a cruising altitude? There's no, uh, maybe for other CEOs, there's no cruising altitude <laughs> at Apple. Tim Cook is a manager with a vision who is following in the footsteps of a visionary turned manager. While he has to worry about global issues like the counterfeiters who instantly turn out fake copies of every new Apple product, Cook has to keep one eye on the stock price constantly and the other on the future. And that sure sounds like it means TV. What can Apple do for television watching? What do you know that is going to change the game that we don't know yet? It's a market that we see that has been left behind. You know, I used to watch the Jetsons as a kid. Absolutely. Meet George Jetson. I love the Jetsons. He's right there with Elroy. We're living the Jetsons with this. George, George, you'll never guess what happened. El FaceTime is the Jetsons, but television is still television. It's, it's, it's an area of intense interest. I, I can't say more than that. <laughs> but I'm not shocked. All right, complete this sentence. Ten years from now, Americans are going to be amazed that they ever... What's the... Give us broad generalities. What's the new thing? Uh, <laughs> just, it's okay to tell me. Let it. this stuff out. Let yeah. you, what, whatever you're thinking of for the future, it's all right. Our, our whole role in life is to give you something you didn't know you wanted, and then once you get it, you can't imagine your life without it. Starting with... And you can count on Apple doing that. <laughs> oh, man, that's frustrating. So television is an area of intense interest. That's almost a declaration in Apple speak.